love um, we would love any questions you have. We would love to know how you feel. I, I just wanted to first of all, I, 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 this is incredible to see so many of you here. I mean, it's it's we've been living this for three years on this film, three years plus, and then you know I, I started covering war when I was basically a kid as a coffee runner for Amy Goodman, the host of Democracy Now! And, and just to be here with all of you is, I, I'm, just, I'm overwhelmed. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, if you looked at our credits carefully, and it's why we really wanted the whole thing to play, um, you'll read the names of people in Afghanistan, Somalia, Pakistan, uh, Yemen, that, that really made this film. And, uh, and they know that this is happening tonight. And it means the world to them. It means the world to them. Funny story is that Sheikh Salah bin Farid, the tribal leader who discovered this massacre in Yemen, <laughs> called me up after he heard the news about Sundance. Um, <laughs> you know, and he was getting medical care. He was in the hospital, and he called me up and he said, uh, "Robert Redford's going to see this movie." <laughs> he had no idea what Sundance was, but he Googled it. There's Blackberry in this hospital bed, and then to him, it was the, the idea that Robert Redford might see his film. What meant that it was real, meant, meant that allowing us into the pain of their lives, and it's true, so many people, our brother Bashir Osman, who took us through Somalia and got us through alive, knows that this film's playing tonight. Raouf Hikal, who took us into Gardaz in Afghanistan, who was shot at by the Taliban for, for doing it, and risked his own life to work with us in an area that's controlled by the Taliban and the Haqqani Network, which is a U.S. terror designated terror organization. All of those folks know that you're here tonight. They, might, they may not know your name, but it means the world to them that all of you are here, that Sundance is here, that all of you who supported this uh, did so with everything you had. And there's so many people in the room, and we just, we thank you all. We thank you all. Oh, to the beginning of the, of the film project. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so we've known each other forever, and we're, and, and been part of this for a long time. Uh, and when we began, um, we had no idea how this film would, would, would end. Uh, I mean, we, um, the, the film begins as it begins. We were in Afghanistan. Uh, and we, we uh, you know, I'd been an embedded reporter. We'd both been covering these wars forever. And I knew, we all knew that there was this other war going on that we weren't allowed to see. And so we, we set out to try to find that war and, and film that war. Uh, and we heard about this massacre where the pregnant women were killed. Um, and. Uh, and then, I mean, actually, uh, to, to tell you the story of how we made it is to tell you the, the story that you've just seen. I mean, we found ourselves drawn in through these people's lives into, um, into a global story about a war that is being fought um, in, in, you know, not just in the three countries of the room, but in, in 70 countries. Uh, that's being fought in our name without our knowledge. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, but we, we never imagined uh, in Afghanistan that, that uh, in the beginning that we would end up in the streets of Mogadishu or, or in Yemen. We never imagined when we were talking to the victims of, to the Afghan victims of a U.S. night raid, that we would end the film uh, talking to the parent, to the grandparents of a 16-year-old American uh, who was killed by these same forces. Um, so it has been an incredible journey of, of discovery for us. I mean, the scope of things is just, yeah. that this film for now is called Dirty Wars is because I, I, I think we're living in an age uh, when we're, we're being sold the idea that, that drone war is clean war um, and, and that the individuals that are being killed are, are the leaders of cells of people that want to do harm to Americans or harm U.S. national security. And, and it's true, there are threats out there. And there are people that would love nothing more than to bring down a U.S. airliner. But, but we, have, we have taken, like, you know, a, a nuclear bomb and dropped it on a problem that... that it's like a fly swatter. And we're, we are making more enemies than we're eliminating. You know, after bin Laden's death, Al-Qaeda is still thriving in so many of these countries, controlling territory, 
throughout the Horn of Africa and in the Arabian Peninsula. And, and for us, and part of the reason why we wanted to tell the story of, of American citizens being targeted by their own government is not because we believe Anwar al-Awlaki is a great man. He, he clearly was, was reprehensible on, on so many different levels in what he was doing and, and the things that he got himself involved with. Um, but there's a reason why people turn in that way. And, and, and if, if we don't stand up when people we like are in power, when people we may have voted for are in power, that's when your principles are tested, not when someone that you despise is in office. And so to, to me, the future of our republic is at stake <coughs> because the, the, the line is becoming blurred. And the line between a free society and an unfree society, what, what defines us as, as, the, as the, 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 the light of hope in the world? It's the, it's, the, it's the rule of law. It's some sort of a moral code by which you live your life. And if we're killing our own citizens without indicting them, without trying them, what does it say about our society? So, hell yes. People on Capitol Hill need to hear about all of these issues. One film's not going to change that. It takes a movement of people who are going to make sure that their representatives hear from them. We don't want unaccountable killing machines operating in our name. We understand threats are real, but we want a real dialogue in this country. And we haven't had that for a long time. We're operating by, out of fear. We, we, we need to liberate ourselves from that so that we can have an honest dialogue about what, what does a responsible counterterrorism policy look like? What does a responsible foreign policy look like? We're not having that, that dialogue right now. Yeah, I'm part of a movement to have a revolution in this country. And your film, frankly, you know, looking at it, makes me feel even more than I have in my entire life that the need for this kind of fundamental change has to happen sooner rather than later. This kind of thing going on all over the world is just not tolerable. You know, and I'm watching, and having said that, I, I want to come off of the last question and your response, Jeremy, because I think we have to look at what the hell is it going to take to make people here understand that American lives are not more important than the lives of other people in the world, and that history did not begin in 2001. All of these things that, are, you know, what's, what generates all of this stuff has a lot to do with what the U.S. does all over the world. And I think it's really, it's beholden to us to actually stand up. And I think I really agree with your point about stand up and get a movement in the streets. But frankly, look, this is a place where a lot of people, people from my generation, from the 60s, have put their fingers in their ears and are willfully blinding themselves to what's going on in the world. I think your film can make a tremendous crack in that, but I'd like to hear what you think. Well, I mean, I, it feel, I mean, you sort of you made a statement there, and I think I said, I mean, it's. I, I think we should try to let some other people get in, but I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I was. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Sundance. Thank you, and thanks, you Sundance. Um, I'm deeply upset. The, the way a good documentary or a good film can do. My response is emotional. I'm not going to give you a political um, discussion. But what, I'm, what I've been struggling with and what your film is sort of focused on is when did it become permissible to say kill? It's, it's in Catherine Bigelow's film when Maya says, kill him for me. When the president says, kill. When did this become permissible? And what do, I mean, the film addresses that, but the, on a deeper American sort of soul level, when did this become common language that is used in the media? When did it become, you're journalists that were in the war zones. You have death around you all of the time. But this is calculated murder someone sitting very far away giving a command, and it's acceptable. When did that happen? Rick's our historian. <laughs> <laughs> I see Robert Reich is here. Maybe he could, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great historian also. He could, he could maybe address that. But. Yeah, I think, I mean, this war perpetuates itself and continues by partially by being unseen. I mean, it's secret for a reason. It's secret because, as you say, I think a lot of Americans would be outraged if they knew that every other week we were, we were dropping bombs on countries like Yemen or Pakistan, if they knew that we were 
backing an all-out proxy war in the Horn of Africa, uh, if they knew that there were that there were a dozen other wars that we're fighting that we don't even that we don't even know about. Um, I mean, these wars are hidden for a reason, and they're hidden because uh, because the Americans would be outraged if they knew. And so this film is an attempt to make that invisible war visible. Uh, I mean, and it's uh, I mean, I I believe I believe that. Uh, the American people wouldn't allow this to happen if, if, if everyone knew. But it's a complicated media like system that we're operating in. It's not just that some things are hidden, some things are made brilliantly. We're, we're drowned in details about some. Uh, as an example, we know, everyone knows about one raid that JSOC did on May 2nd, 2011. We know everything about it. We know how many SEALs were in the helicopters. We knew what kind of helicopters they were. We know that they had a dog with them that was a Belgian Malinois named Cairo. We knew what their rifles were uh, when they killed Osama bin Laden. Those same units conducted 30,000 other night raids in 2011. Uh, that's a conservative sort of estimate. We know nothing about those night raids. Uh, I mean, so we're, we're, we're drowned in details of this tiny little sliver of this war, um, of this war that is the most important event of my generation's lifetime. It's the longest war in American history. It's a war that's claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, it's a war uh, that we know next to nothing about. I, I just want to add one thing. I mean, being a member of you know, the, the, the press uh, and, and working for a number of years in the media, I mean, we, hold, we have a tremendous uh, responsibility in, in creating this problem. And um, you know, we, I, I, I think, in general, Journalism is asleep at the wheel right now, um, as much as Congress is. You saw Jim Sensenbrenner, the Republican from Wisconsin, walk out of that hearing as it was beginning. That's, that's exactly what happened that day. You know, the people that are supposed to be overseeing this are supposed to be asking the tough questions, aren't doing it. For the most part, journalists are not asking these questions. There are some fantastic journalists, and some of them work for the New York Times and CNN, and some of them no one has ever heard of. And they're, and they're Arab journalists, or they're Somali journalists, and they're unfamous journalists, and they're the ones on the front lines taking the risk, and because Abdullah Bahaider Shia is in jail today. We know that journalists pay high prices for what they do. Record-setting numbers of journalists are being killed. So on the one hand, we have a sort of culture of failure in, in our kind of infotainment society in this country. It should be the fourth estate. It should be a, a, a central part of who we are as a society. Um, but instead, we, we have infotainment journalism where reality television is what the, you know, the housewives you know, do on the weekend and, and Pinot Grigio being IV'd into the arm. And, and, and the real widows of, of Kandahar or Mogadishu uh, or, or, or Jalalabad, they're, they're back page news. We need, to, we need to flip that order. But it's, it's journalists, it's Congress, and it ultimately it's people standing up and, and, and demanding something better. This is a long war that we're in to try to change this. There's no overnight solution. But we, 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 we persevere, and it's all of our responsibility, whether we're Kara Mertes, who's here supporting amazing films and filmmakers, many of them no one's ever heard of until Sundance, or it's journalists in the field, or it's human rights activists, or it's lawyers. All of us have a responsibility on some level to become citizen journalists in our daily life, even if we're not publishing somewhere. We're spreading the word. We're holding each other accountable. We're going to take one more comment, and then I want you to give us a very short version of your dream vision of how you'd like to see this film go out in the world. So, comment from the back. I'd actually love a woman to speak. I haven't heard from a woman. So that everybody can hear.